Let's cover the mechanism of action of mirtazapine. Mirtazapine is classified as a NASSA, which is a noradrenergic serotonin specific antagonist. This group also has another agent known as meanserine. And there are some subtle differences in terms of its noradrenergic activity and antihistaminergic activity compared to mirtazapine. Here we'll cover mirtazapine specifically because it's more commonly used. Meanserine is also associated with agranulocytosis as a side effect, and it's potentially one of the reasons why it might have fallen out of favor. Now, what's interesting about mirtazapine is that it has dual effects at different doses. So if I think about the lower doses of mirtazapine at 15 to 30 milligrams, it predominantly acts as a serotonin specific antagonism. Now, of course, it's not as clear cut, but it helps us understand how to use mirtazapine effectively and why patients may have certain both benefits and side effects at differing doses. The noradrenergic effect requires us to increase the dose of mirtazapine to above 30 milligrams. So 45 to 60 milligrams is considered. Now the maximum doses in some places is only talked about at 45 milligrams. However, there is good evidence of increased dopaminergic and noradrenergic activity at higher doses of mirtazapine. And that's what we need when we want to treat the severe melancholic form of depression to look at that noradrenaline and dopamine potentiation. So let's start off with the serotonin specific antagonism. Which serotonin receptors does it antagonize? First, the 5-HT2A receptor. We know that the 5-HT2A receptor is situated in the limbic system when activated results in anxiety. It's situated in the basal ganglia when activated akathisia can result and it can also blunt the ventral striatum resulting in emotional blunting, decreased reward. The 5-HT2A receptor is situated in the reticular activating system and when activated can actually impede or reduce slow wave sleep. In some cases, nocturnal myoclonus can occur when 5-HT2A receptors activated. Next, it antagonizes the 5-HT2C receptor. And finally, the 5-HT3 receptor. The 5-HT2C receptor mediates sexual function, 5-HT2A also to a certain extent. 5-HT2C receptor, when activated, has an anorexic effect. And 5-HT3, we know, mediates gut activity, it's present in the hypothalamus, in the nausea, vomiting area. Therefore, if that was activated, we get diarrhea and vomiting in certain situations. And we know that these three receptors are activated when SSRIs are prescribed. What mirtazapine does is it blocks all three of these receptors. Therefore, these are the benefits that are obtained. By blocking the 5-HT2A, we have anti-anxiety effects. We have anti akathisia effects. Note, there is no emotional blunting because there is no blockade of the ventral striatum dopamine release. Then, it promotes slow wave sleep. 5-HT2C, no sexual dysfunction. It can increase appetite. 5-HT3, it usually prevents nausea, vomiting, and in consultation liaison practice, for example, one can use a small dose of mirtazapine, particularly to provide anti-anxiety effects, but also if individuals have nausea and vomiting, say for example, because of cancer treatment. So if they're experiencing anxiety and depression and on chemotherapy and experiencing nausea and vomiting, mirtazapine can act as a good agent there. Note that ondansetron, which is used in cancer chemotherapy, is a very effective anti-nausea, anti-vomiting agent, is a specific 5-HT3 antagonist. Mirtazapine's got 5-HT3 antagonism as one of its properties. So, you can see that mirtazapine at these lower doses can provide quite a few benefits, specifically with regards to the anti-anxiety effect. It also has one additional receptor antagonism, and that's the histamine receptor. 
By blocking this particular receptor, it increases sedation, which is different from the improvement in the slow wave sleep. So mirtazapine overall, as we know in clinical practice, helps with sedation. But in some individuals, they can feel groggy during the day. This same receptor, antihistaminergic agents are notorious for weight gain as well. Mirtazapine is also associated with weight gain. Now, let's look at the noradrenergic side. And here comes the alpha-2 receptor. We know we have the presynaptic alpha-2 receptor and the postsynaptic alpha-2 receptor. So whenever we're talking about a presynaptic receptor, it will decrease adrenergic activity. In this case, nor adrenaline, because alpha-2 receptors are predominantly activated by noradrenaline. So therefore, if a presynaptic receptor is activated, it will reduce noradrenaline. Mirtazapine is a alpha-2 presynaptic antagonist. So by blocking this, what we get is increase in noradrenaline. And mirtazapine is much, much more selective for the presynaptic alpha-2 rather than the postsynaptic alpha-2. And it's also much more selective for the central alpha-2 receptor. So that's one property. We've got increased noradrenaline, which we know is beneficial in the treatment of more severe forms of depression. Mirtazapine also has a property on the alpha-2 heteroreceptors on serotonergic neurons. Now, what do heteroreceptors mean? So on serotonergic neurons, there are alpha-2 receptors. So whenever you have a neuron and you have a receptor related to a completely different neurotransmitter, that's called a heteroreceptor. Now, what mirtazapine does through the action on those heteroreceptors is increases serotonin as well, but not to the same extent as, say, SSRIs. So you have this mild increase in serotonin. Having said that, mirtazapine can be used successfully as an augmentation strategy without resulting in serotonin syndrome. So mirtazapine can be combined with SSRIs or SNRIs without major concerns with serotonergic potentiation. And that's because of the 5-HG2A, 5-HG2C and 5-HG3 antagonism. So many of these excessive serotonin potentiation is not obtained or does not result from mirtazapine prescription. So it's a safe agent to be used as an augmentation strategy. And finally, besides the increase in serotonin that we just talked about, you see this serotonin activates the 5-HT1A receptor. Activation of the 5-HT1A receptor has an interesting effect on dopamine. So 5-HT1A activation increases prefrontal cortex dopamine. So now when we think about mirtazapine overall, we've got a lot of benefits through anti-anxiety, promoting slow wave sleep, anti-agitation effects, or rather anti-akathesic effects, sedative effects. We've got no sexual dysfunction, no emotional blunting. It can increase appetite and weight gain, unfortunately. It's got anti-nausea and anti-vomiting effects as well. If I need to treat the more severe forms of depression, I need to get noradrenaline and dopamine. And therefore, I need to increase the doses of mirtazapine to 45 and 60. So instead of just antagonizing these receptors, I need to increase the dose so I get two additional effects, which is the alpha-2 presynaptic antagonism, therefore increased noradrenaline. Interestingly, clonidine is a presynaptic agonist, which means that it reduces noradrenaline, hence why it's helpful in reducing hyperarousal symptoms. The second property of mirtazapine, as you can see here, is by increasing serotonin through the action on the heteroreceptors, the alpha-2 heteroreceptors on the serotonergic neurons, I get an increase in serotonin, which activates the 5-HD1A receptor and therefore increases dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. Because mirtazapine does not have significant serotonergic potentiation, advantages include augmentation. It can be used as an augmentation strategy and also is not associated with ACE-IDH. In fact, it's one of the agents that can be used when you're confronted with hyponatremia due to SSRIs or SNRIs.